sure about taking care. We're so glad you're here today with us. As I said, the snow won't keep us down.
few announcements this morning. First off, glad you're here. Give yourself a little applause for the ambitious. For those who have more than that, we're going to have ambitious things here. Good people. Good people. Fellowship Fund will be taking a special collection on that today. I'm sure Pastor will talk more about that. So make sure you read the bulletin in here. Pika has another trip coming up. I don't know what this pike is, but I gotta get involved. They're going all the time. I'm telling you what I feel like. Partners and Christian Partners in crime? What? No? <laughs> oh, that's what John does. Partners in, crime. Partners in Christian activities. No, I know what they are. They got stuff going on all the time. Check it out. How was the Eagle watching? We came to this. In fact, we're going this Thursday. Okay, so we're at Eagle Watching Thursday. Be here what, 8.30? 8.30. 8.30. If they didn't sign up the last time, they need to sign up or let me know so we have okay. cars. Yeah. Okay. Everybody get that? Yes. If you didn't sign up last time, make sure you see Barb before you leave today if you want to go. Make sure they got rides lined up. Thursday at 8, Eagle Watching. And it should be much better weather this week. Yes. Food Pantry, if anybody's available to help with Food Pantry on Mondays, uh, see Jeff Stanley about that. Uh, the number is in the bulletin, or you can stop and let the office know that you're willing to help. That is an incredible ministry that our church is involved in. How many families are we feeding a week with that, roughly? Uh, up to 300. Up to 300 families a week this church is serving this community. I think that's it. That's pretty exciting. We need to be in prayer that that number actually decreases, or the need decreases. But, be in prayer for the funds, the staff, the means to continue that here. Because yeah. We know that need is just going to go away. So with that, I will turn it over to the Yeah, amen. 
And uh, we want to keep you in prayer and your family. And as we know that she said he knew the Lord. So she knows where he's at. Amen. He's in the presence of a living God. Amen. And that's our hope. That is our hope. We have Christ Jesus as our strength. There are many today that are on our concern list. In your bulletin, you'll see this. But what I ask, and I asked of you before, let us not just look at the list. Let us take the list home and begin to pray. Begin to ask God to move upon those that are standing in need this morning. Not only are they a concern to us, but it's a concern to God and with what they're going through. We also want to remember those in the nursing home, those that are in extended care. And then also remember our sons and daughters that are in the military. Christ is our hope. We find that you may not be there, but you're going through something. You may not be on the list, but you're going through something. And I want you to know this morning that Christ is our answer. Several people said to me, don't get close to me, Pastor says, uh, we're not feeling well, we got something. I said, no, not a problem. I got something too. So we're all going through something. But we have him who is able. Amen. We have Jesus. We have Jesus. Amen. We have Jesus. Amen. And so we thank God this morning for who he is in our heart and in our, in our lives. Let us pray. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for waking us up, starting us on our way. You remind us, dear Heavenly Father, that you are in control of everything. And that what may be a surprise to us is not a surprise to you. For you are our strength. And as we come today, Lord, we ask that you administer to those, Lord, that we mentioned on our concern list. Those in the nursing home and those in the military. Those, dear Heavenly Father, that are without jobs and looking for a job. And be with those, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that have the mind to work, but are unable. Lord, you know what we need today. We need you. We need you to manifest your self, Lord, within our hearts and our minds, Lord, within our physical being. We need, Lord, to, to know that you are there to guide us and direct us. And so, Lord, we're asking for your wisdom to guide us, to strengthen us. We're thanking you, Lord, that you're the foundation on which we stand upon, dear Lord, and we know that even when the storms of life go our way, we will not tumble because you are there. And so, Lord, we welcome you today, Lord, to just minister to our hearts. We even thank you, Lord, for the snow that has fallen because we know, Lord, the moisture will go into the ground and the crops will grow strong and, and tall, Lord, uh, this spring. And so, Lord, we thank you. For every good thing that comes, we know it comes from you. And so we ask you today to just minister to each and every one of us. Be with our families. Um, Lord, uh, Amelie and John's uh, granddaughter, uh, I heard it was in an accident. Lord, and we ask that you be with her, Lord, as well. And so, Lord, as those on our hearts, you know, we ask that you would touch, strengthen, keep. We ask all these things in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we prepare our hearts to give this morning, let us be mindful that it is a fellowship on Sunday. That is helping those that are in need. We're not giving handouts, we're giving hands up. Just to encourage someone to let them know that we're here, that, there's, um, that we care about what's going on in their life. Because I don't know about you, but I've had times when I needed somebody to give me a hand. I needed help. I, I didn't want to ask, but I needed it anyhow. And sometimes we just need to know that when you give, you're just telling somebody that we are there and that we love them. And so as you give this morning, let us give with a cheerful heart unto the Lord. Ushers, would you wait upon us now?
as Christians and we need to pray for one another. We need to ask other people if they need any prayers. Do you guys need any prayers today? Is there anyone you want to pray for? weather to go away and it's been summer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you guys just close your eyes and bow your heads and pray with me. Father God, I thank you for this day. It's snowing, but we're here. We're together. We're praising you, Lord. And I, I thank you for everyone here. All these kids. And I thank you for working in my body, Lord, and, and healing me. Turn me inside out. We just want to praise you today, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
we prepare our hearts, as we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, these sacraments symbolize the God's promise of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that everything that Christ has done for us has been fulfilled. That we can have new life in Him. It is a time for us to reach out our hands and receive the bread and the fruit. It is a time for us to remind ourselves of God's greatest gift, His Son, and His love for us. In communion, we recommit ourselves to focus on Jesus Christ and not allow the cares of the world to distract us as we remember the birth and death of our Savior, the King, the everlasting King. And so, as you come now, that you would wait upon us. The teaching gives you, I give you is the same teaching I received from the Lord. On the night when the Lord Jesus had handed over to be killed, he took the bread and he gave thanks for it. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we do come. Got that on. Gracious. Gracious Father, we do come to you this morning, giving you all of the praise and glorifying you because you gave your son for us. That because we died, you died for us. Amen. And Father, we just thank you and we uh, proclaim this bread as uh, we're standing before your table. We uh, know that the, your body is broken for us and through that, with you in our hearts, that with your body, we can Get the strength from you, Father, and your Son, Jesus Christ. We just proclaim you until the day you come. We thank you and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
In Luke 22, the scriptures remind us, when the hour had come, Jesus and the apostles with him sat at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly the desire to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I'll not eat of it again until the fulfillment of the kingdom of God has come. And he took the bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, this is my body which has been given for you. And when you take this bread, do this in remembrance of me. Let us see. again on the night when the Lord Jesus handed over to be killed. The word tells us that he also took the cup and prayed. And so we now give thanks for the cup of blessing, which symbolized the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the Lord, this cup doesn't represent your blood. The Lord, we just thank you, Lord. You died upon that cross for our sins. We ask that you be with us, Lord, and continue to die and correct our weakness through Christ Jesus.
After taking the cup, Jesus gave thanks. Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come. And in the same manner, Jesus taking the cup, this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. And when you drink it, do it, do it in remembrance of me. Let us drink. We are mindful that every time we eat and take the bread, that we're telling others of the Lord's death and of his resurrection and his soon coming again. We give thanks for the cup of blessings that represents the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank God for all that he has done. And so when we take communion, it's not something that we do lightly. We have a promise that one day he is coming back. Amen. And so we're not like them who have no hope. We have an eternal hope, and that hope is in Jesus. Amen. for the reading of the word. This morning we're going to look at Isaiah 43, verses 10 through 13. What, did you read the word with me? Ready, read. You are my witness, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, and there was no strange God among you. So you who are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Even from eternity I am He, and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act. Father, we come today and we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this word of life that you give us. That we who are in you, Lord, understand we are witnesses of your goodness. We are a witness, Lord, of new life. We are witnesses, Lord, of eternal life. And we thank you now, Lord. As we read the the word, Lord, look at it. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to minister to us, guide us, and direct us. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would be strengthened and encouraged by this word this morning. Write it upon our hearts. Give us the courage, Lord, to walk it out, and we will bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. These words that we're looking at this morning out of Isaiah. The Lord is talking to his people. I know that this is a word and a promise that he has given to the nation of Israel. That he has chosen them. This nation was a, a people, a group of people. And these people were just like you and I. But there was one man in the midst of these people. Because there was no... Israelite uh, nation. There was no group but that was called Jews. They were just people. But Jesus looked at a man named Abraham and he took Abraham and he said, I will take you. I will bless you. And I will raise a nation up out of you. And the nation was formed and the nation is Israel. The Jewish nation. And so when the Lord says, you are my witness, He's letting them know that it is him that has caused them to be. And so when we look at the word of God, I, I had to go back and, uh, and, and think about the fact that the redeeming power of God is not only to the nation of Israel, but he has also redeemed us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
I want us to hear the promises that God has said. I want us to hear who he says he is. Because I think it's so important that when we understand who God is and our inability to understand who God is, because we'll never be able to comprehend it in this flesh, and it will take eternity on for us to understand the love of God and why he would choose us to save us. But as we look at the Word of God, we need to understand this morning that we are in Him and that we have been made whole because of Jesus Christ. And because of Jesus Christ, God is saying to us, He is God all by Himself. And so as we look at the text, we want to look at, uh, someone said this morning to me, they said, uh, Caleb will be the next pastor at this church. <laughs> It's after I'm gone. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's my buddy. In verse 1 it says, it talks about Israel being redeemed. I want to read this to you. But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I will give Egypt as a ransom and Cush and Seba in your place. Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored, I love you. And I declare and I give other men in your place and other people in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring you and your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. And I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who called by my name and whom I have created for my glory. Whom I have formed, even whom I have made. We want to stop right there. And this here, Jesus is saying how he took and made a people out of Abraham. A nation. A nation he promised Abraham you would have kings and, and princes. You would have all because I will raise you up and cause you to become a great nation. And out of you, a savior would be born. And God is reminding Israel at this time in Isaiah of his promises and who he is. I like the fact that God has told them and, and gives them this assurance that he has redeemed them. I have Pay the price for you. And when I looked at the scriptures for redemption, 1 Corinthians 6 20 says, For you are bought with a price, and therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And Luke 1 says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited the redeemed and redeemed his people. Galatians 3 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. It tells us about God's love for us and that he has redeemed man from being lost to being found. That we have him to know him as our Lord and our Savior, that he is our strength, and that we can know that his word is forever. For we studied all last year that his word would go out and it would perform all that he set it out to do. And that his word would not come back to him empty. And when his word goes out, it says it will create, it will cause newness to happen. And that newness is in you and it's in, and in me. And so as we look at the word this morning, I want us to understand we have been redeemed. We have been redeemed. There was a uh, the coupon people, Angie's group, 
that meet on the first Thursdays of each month here at the church. They use a lot of coupons and they're able to go in and redeem a lot of stuff with their coupons. They're able to use those coupons and it knocks down the price. They're able to get this and, and when they bring that piece of paper in that it says to them that they can get 25% off. That they can get 25, 25 cents off. And sometimes they can take an object that costs $100 and they get it for pennies because of the coupon. It gives them power to be able to say, I can purchase that. Well, God has redeemed us. And said the blood of Jesus Christ was enough to cover your sins and cover my sins. And so as we come this morning, I want us to know that when he talks about redeeming Israel, I want us to see us in this picture that God has formed for us, that we would understand that I have been and you have been bought by a price. The price of the precious blood that comes to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hebrews 9 tells us about redemption. Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own, his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Talking about Jesus. That it was not by the blood of goats, by the blood of animals, but it was the precious blood of God who came in the form of a man that gave his life for us. Redemption. We have been redeemed. And so when we look at these verses in verses 1 through 7, Jesus is saying, God is saying to the nation of Israel, but now thus says the Lord, your creator. He's letting us know that he is the creator, not only of, of Israel, for it was a people that became a people. God's people. He created that nation. But you are Christians and you have been created through Christ Jesus. So listen to these words. O Jacob, he who has formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. I sometimes think that, some, that we as Christians are not comforted in knowing that I belong to the Lord. You belong to God. You are His handiwork. You have been formed through Him. And so here where the Word of God is spoken to us, it's reminding us. He has redeemed us and then He knows us. He has called us by name and He says in your mind. You belong to God. You through Christ Jesus are part of the family of God. And I think sometimes we live beneath who we are because we don't understand how much God loves us and how He cares for us. That he has called us to this place. And so he's reminding this nation that is going through some hard times at, that, at this particular time. And saying to them that you're mine. I caused you to be. You didn't do this on your own. I'm your strength. I'm your key. And so here he goes on to tell them that no matter what comes their way, he is greater than the circumstances that they find themselves facing. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers, and they will not overflow you. Oh, you know we hear that old saying, I'll see you tomorrow if the creek don't rise. It don't have nothing to do with the creek. The Lord says, I'm greater than the creek. I will watch over you. I will keep you. And it doesn't matter how high the water comes up. It will always go back. The hurricanes come. The rivers flood their banks. But they go back to that place because in the beginning, the word of God says, I will separate the water from the land and you will not cross it again. Just like sin that is in the world. Every now and then the oceans splash up on the land, but they go back. The rivers go out of their banks, but they go back. And God is letting us know that he is God and he is in control. And even when we find ourselves going through things in our own lives, we need to know. That when the floods come, God is in control. And he says, you are mine. And I know you by name. He says, when you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flames burn you. It gets a little hot in the kitchen every now and then. But you will not be burned. You will not even smell like smoke. 
I'm thinking about the Hebrew boys when the word of God says that they were cast into the fiery furnace and said when they came out, they did not even smell of smoke. Now, I don't know about you. I've been at a campfire. And when you stand by the campfire, everything you have on is smoky. But when God is in the midst, he says, even the smoke will not adhere to you because I am your God. You need to know you're living in a world today, but God is able to hold you and keep you. And the, the contaminants of the world will not overtake you. And sometimes we look at the world and we begin to say that how things are so bad. And because the world is the way it's going, that how it is hard to live. But the word of God here tells us he is our protector. He watches over us. He keeps us. And he is greater than the obstacles that you find facing you each and every day. And so when we look at the scriptures this morning, for I am your God. He says, I, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And I have given Egypt as your ransom and Cush and Seba in your place. God is saying to us is that he loves us so much, he'll sacrifice others to take care of us. He'll take from others to bless us. Last night, I think of the fifth, at the dinner auction there was a, a basket that had $50 of um, lottery tickets on it. The preacher's wife bid on it and won it. <laughs> if she won, she didn't tell me. <laughs> she may be gone when I get home. <laughs> Someone said, God will take from the wicked and give it to his. When the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, they did not go out empty-handed. For they, the children of Egypt, those people gave all to the children of Israel, their gold, their silver, their fine clothes and garments. And so here it tells us that it says, I will take from them. It's not that he's saying that I'm, I will harm other people. He says, this is how precious you are. I'm God and you're mine. And I will make sure that you are kept, that you will be in a good place. I will be your strength. I will watch over you. So the creek can rise and the fire can get turned up in the kitchen and it will not matter because I will be God for you. He's telling us that we don't have to look at all the circumstances and situations that come our way because sometimes we get so distracted by also the stuff. We're looking around and we're saying these things, they, if it wasn't for the stuff, everything would be all right. But here the word of God is telling us that God is in control. That he's in control of not only your life, but he's control, in control of everything in this world. A God in whom we, we love and who loves us. And so he goes on to say to them, Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, I will give other men in your place and other people in exchange for your life. When I read that, I said, oh God, now, I wouldn't want nobody to take my, my place if I've done wrong. But he said, I sent my son and he took your place. And he did no wrong. And so when he says this here, he's not just talking about there are times when there have been others that, that would not follow God and because of that he punished them. And he had to show mercy to Israel. But we know that they went through a lot. They were persecuted. They were uh, captive. 
And they spent most of their time, even when the, in the New Testament, when it talks about the Jewish people, they said, we've always been free. Well, when you read the Old Testament, you know they have not been free. And at that time, even Rome was in control over them at that time. But he is saying to us, this is what I'll do for you. I love you so much, I will even sacrifice on your behalf. I will give up something to redeem you. That's how much he loves us. So do not fear. Do not fear. Sometimes I think that the people in, that I'm running into are dealing with fear in their life. Fear to be able to overcome the things that are coming their way. Fear of, of just sometimes just waking up in the morning to deal with the everyday things that are facing them. I used to be out there in the world and I remember times when I would be, I go out and I would party because I had problems. But Frank, when I woke up the next day, I felt bad and I still had problems. It didn't matter what came my way. The problems didn't change because I tried this or tried that. But when I gave my heart to Jesus, <laughs> he says, you that are weary and laden, heavy burden, come unto me and rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I found that I found comfort in the struggles of my life. And here the word of God tells us, that we can trust him in every area of our life. Do not fear, for I am with you. God knows everything that's going on in your life. He knows what you're dealing with right now. He knows about the mortgage. He knows about the children, the grandchildren, and all that they're doing out there. He knows what's going on behind closed doors. Oh, your neighbor doesn't know, but God knows everything. And because he knows everything, he's telling you that I see you. And you don't have to fear, for I am with you. I know you're struggling with some things in life, but I am with you. Some of the hope that I've had in my life, and maybe for you as well, is that you have known that no matter what I'm going through, I got Jesus. I got Jesus. In fact, I would even put it this way. I was going to go through that. And because I was going to go through that, God gave me Jesus. And it's like you're going to have trials and tribulations. You're going to have some this and that, some ups and downs. But be of good cheer because Jesus has overcome the world. So he tells us, do not fear for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created. For my glory. We have called upon the name of the Lord and asked him to come and live into our lives. But he says to us that we were created for the glory of God. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't understand how God can use someone like me. Boy, David, you're really quick on that. <laughs> But you're right, David. I, I can't understand why God would use a wretch like me. Or a wretch like you. But the word of God is letting us know that God understands who we are and where we came from. And yet he says, I have chosen you that my glory might be revealed in you. You may not be the fanciest thing in the world, but when you've got the glory of God on 
you. There is nothing that can overtake you. There is nothing that will shine brighter than you when the glory of God is upon you. When you can walk in the peace and the joy of God, when you can walk in the comfort and the understanding of God, there is nothing that can comfort you in knowing that you have Jesus. So when I'm going through the stuff, I can say today, thank God I am Jesus. Jesus said in his own words, for this reason I have come. Now he was talking about going to the cross, dying for the sins of the world, to be buried and rose again on the third day. For this reason I have come, because why? You're going to go through something and you're going to need me. And I'm going to make a way of escape for you. So when the creek rises and the heat turns up in the kitchen, I will be there with you. When I get that down into my heart and into my understanding, I begin to know that I can't be swayed to the left or to the right because of stuff, because why I have Jesus and he is here with me to hold me, to guide me, to keep me, no matter what I'm going through. And that you have him to be your strength. I think it's important sometimes because you think you're going through this world and you're going through all by yourself, but you're not if you're a child of God. He says, I have made provisions for you. And so just like Israel, who were not a people, that he made a people and raised up to be a great nation. You were nobodies who have become somebody that is able now to tell everybody about Jesus. He says, for my glory. For my glory, I've raised you up. I've raised you up so that others might know that I am God and I'm able to minister no matter what. So I'm going to draw you from the north, the south, the east, and the west. I'm going to bring you from all directions. And so it doesn't matter where you've been. God has continued to say, you are mine. In the Bible study, we were looking at the Word of God, and we discovered in that Word that every person born, their name is in the book of life. Because he said, I had created you for my glory. The Word of God tells us that not everybody will receive Christ as their Savior, will not put their faith and trust in God. And because of that, one day their names will be blotted out but to be blotted out, it means that your name had to be there. And so when Jesus tells us, and when the Word of God tells us, and God is speaking here in Isaiah, I called you by name, and I created you for my glory. Who I have formed, even whom I have made. And that's what he was saying about Israel. I have formed you. I have made you. I have created you. You were nothing before I came. You were a people. But I formed a nation out of a man named Abraham. But the truth is, you were a nobody, and I was a nobody until Jesus came. My life didn't matter until Jesus came. See, it doesn't matter if you gain the whole world and you don't know Jesus because it says you'll lose your soul. The word here tells us today that God is saying, I'm the one who's making you and will you let me? And then we go on to this part in verse 8 that we started that, that was that I kept for you. It says, Israel is God's witness. I want you to hear verse 8. Bring out the people who are blind, even though they have eyes, and the deaf, even though they have ears. All the nations have gathered together, so that the people may be assembled. Who am, who among them can declare this and proclaim to us the former things? What it's saying about the nation of Israel says you can bring out the people, and it's not talking about that they were blind, blind, or that they were deaf and could not hear, 
or could not see. It meant that they were spiritually not in tune with the things of God. And it said here these were people that were that had no understanding and no relationship to God at any time. And he says, and who among you then can declare this and proclaim to us the former things? And it says, and let them present their witnesses that they may be justified, and let them hear and say it is true. And the truth is, we were nothing until Christ came. We didn't even understand the goodness of God and God's love until we accepted Christ as our Savior. We didn't even know that we were in sin until the Word of God came to us and let us know that we were sinners who needed a Savior. Somebody that was able to change us. Somebody that was able to make us new. And he says, I had to come. The nation was blind, they were deaf, they didn't have a relationship with me, so I created a people. And then I made a way for everyone to know me, and I sent my son to come. And when he came, he came that he might bring all who would trust in him to know them, to know him as their personal savior. And so he tells us that Israel was God's witness, but you know, I'm a witness. You're a witness. You're a witness because you know that you think different, you act different, you talk different, you live different. It's all because of Jesus. It's all because God has touched your life and has transformed you. You desire things that you didn't have before. I'm not talking about the stuff of the world. I mean that you're desiring God's life in you. You're wanting to do better, live better. You're wanting to act better, behave better. And it's all because of Jesus. And here the word of God is telling us because of that. That he says, you are the witnesses that I am real. Now I can tell you right now, many people today know me as this man who has been in ministry for a lot of years. But there's a lot of people out there that remember me back when. And I'm a witness that God can change lives. You're a witness that God can change lives. And that's what the Word is telling us today. And so when we look at verse 10 and we started out this morning, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord and my servants in whom I have chosen. It's important that we know that we did not choose God, he chose us. He knows everything about us and he still chose us. And that's the part that causes me to rejoice. Oh, you know how it is. I remember gym class. They get 10 people and they say now, pick a team. I remember the spelling teams. See, when it came to the sports, I might have been picked first. But when it came to spelling, they started here. All the kids would be picked, and I'd be the last one in the seat. They didn't have spell check. So I know what it is to be on the end of things. But here the word of God says, you are my witness, declares the Lord. No. You are my servant, and I have chosen you. I wasn't the best. You weren't the best. I didn't have it all together. You didn't have it all together. And even if you had a good day, if you were like me, you would figure out a way to mess it up. <laughs> and yet the word here says, he chose us. He chose us to be his. And I thank God this morning for that. It goes on to tell us, so that you, and why he chose us, so that we, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am He. When Jesus had been brought to trial, 
They wanted to know if he was the Messiah, if he was the Savior. And when they came and they captured him there in the garden, he said, I am he. And when he said that, the soldiers fell to the ground. They got back up and said to them, I am he. They fell to the ground. God is saying to us, I am he. I'm the only one that can hold you, keep you for you, and allow you to become all that I created you to be. See, you were created for God's glory. And sometimes we don't understand that. You have been created for God's glory. For his glory. See, we ask that question, why am I here? And God said today, you are created for my glory. Amen. So here it reads, and we'll finish up. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. There is no other God but the one God. And you'll never know the one God unless you know the Son of God, Jesus Christ. For Jesus says that he is the only way to the Father, and no man can come to the Father except through him. And so many times when I've talked to many people, Caterpillar Herald hires a lot of people from different nations. And we begin to talk religion. And sometimes the question or the, in the conversation it would say, well, we serve the same God. And then I just say, so then you believe that God was born of a virgin, that Jesus came born of a virgin, that he walked this earth 33 years, it was his signs and miracles and, and wonders, that he was beaten and bruised and hung on the cross and died for your sins and the sins of the world and rose again. Well, we don't believe like that, but we believe in loving and caring. Then you don't know my God. Because you can't know my God unless you know my Jesus. So here the scripture tells us that he says that we are the witnesses of him. There is no other God and there will be none after him. There's only one God. Even I, even I am the Lord and there is no Savior besides me. There is no other help. All of this today was to get to this place. The only thing we got is Jesus. That's it. Nothing else matters if you don't have Jesus and allowing him to live in your life. You don't have nothing. The only hope you have is it's in Jesus. So he says to us in Scripture, there is no other Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed. And there was no strange God among you. So you are my witnesses. He was letting them know until he showed up to Abraham. You didn't even know there was a God. You didn't know there was a God who could do great and mighty things. That was awesome. A creator of all things could take that that was dead in Sarah's womb and make it come alive. You didn't know there was a God that could part the Red Seas and that your children could walk across dry grounds. You never knew there was a God before me. And we didn't know that life could be this good until Jesus. Your life changed because of Jesus. And so if our life changes because of Christ, why would we 
probably not want to give him all. To live for him, to glorify him in everything that we do and everything that we say. So here it tells us. It is I who declare and saved you and proclaimed. And there is no strange gods among you. So you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. And I am God. Even from eternity I am He. And there is none who can deliver you out of my hand. God's got you. And when God's got you, there's nothing on this earth above, beneath it, that can snatch you out of God's hand. He says, he's got you. I got you. And if you look at it in the natural, all that Israel has went through, they're still taking They tried to destroy them, tried to annihilate them, but God had chosen them, and he has chosen you. Nothing is able to snatch us out of his hand. And then he finishes, I act, and who can reverse it? That's the part that allows us to understand who we are. That when God does what he does, there's nothing that anyone can do to change it. For here the word of God says today, no one is able to snatch you out of my hand. And who can reverse it? Israel is the chosen nation of God, the people of God. And you are God's chosen ones in Christ Jesus. And nobody can change it. You can't change it. God said it is finished. Everything Jesus has done, it is finished. You're his. You're his. And when you know that you are his, shouldn't that want us to do a little bit better? It should give us the encouragement to say, I can do better because why? I am His. And so I'm getting attacked by things of this world. They'll not overtake you. So the creek may rise. You're not going to drown. The fire may get turned up. You will not be burned. And nothing is able to snatch you out of God's hand. If you need prayer this morning as we say, we will pray with you. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, we will ask you to come forward this morning for prayer. If you desire to join this church, we'd ask that you would come forward. But let us stand amazed. Amen.